Uh, the other thing we should mention is that by the nature of this work, obviously some of this material, some people might find a little bit distressing. So please, you know, take appropriate action for yourself. If you don't like the sound of this, then we, we won't be offended if you go away. I think that's all our housekeeping notes. So I think we'll, I shall now hand over to Professor Marcus Grant, who will show us some slides. Um, we'll have questions at the end. Please feel free to wave or if you prefer to send a text with your questions and we'll try to answer them later. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Liz. <clears throat> and thanks everybody for being there. I, I'm in Spain at the moment, so... Um, going back to Oxford soon. So regards from Spain, thanks for, for being here. I'm a, an archaeologist, um, but in the last 10 years, I've been working mainly for police cases in the UK. Um, so my, my talk is, although I look at human remains from, say, Roman times and pre-Roman times to medieval, um, this talk is particularly focused on sort of the last sort of UK for police cases uh, and abroad. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, it's going to be about 40 minutes talk and then we'll have time for questions. Um, there, isn't any, there aren't any gory pictures because of, um, you know, um, ethical issues and so on. It's the mainly internet images, but mainly human rema remains, uh, skeletal remains. So the main thing is what the bones tell us, okay? So if you're examining a skeleton, what can we tell from that skeleton? And that is the work of forensic or physical anthropologists. As you know, and some of you may be anthropologists, within the field of anthropologists, uh, there is, you know, um, social cultural anthropologists looking at material culture. There's the biological anthropology, which is um, the one that looks at the human body. So it's evolution, um, how we evolve, um, how we compare to, to other okay. primates. Hello, yeah. And within these fields of anthropology, we have um, forensic anthropology, which is the application of physical anthropology, looking at the body, in particular the skeleton, to the legal process. Um, the legal process can vary depending on the country. So in Britain, the police will be happy to know if human remains are over or than 70 years. If, it's, if they're over 70 or 100 years, they're archaeological. If they're... Um, in the last 100 years or even 70 years, it depends on, there's no, no, no fixed legislation on that, and they'll be of police interest. In other countries like Portugal and Spain and Italy and France, um, what becomes a forensic case is only the last 25 years, okay? So anything, any human remains that are dating to 50 years, they are, um, you know, not of forensic significance. And in the United States, it depends on the states you belong to. So in some states, it's the 50 years where the difference between archaeological and forensic is, and in some states, it's actually 150 years. But what we do is we mainly deal with dead. Okay? We do sometimes deal with the living. So, for example, we may X-ray an individual who has come, um, who has come into a country with no documentation, and we look at the age of the person through um, the, the, the skeleton. But when we deal with human skeletal remains, we've got some dogs in the background. So when we look at uh, TV and documentaries and they talk about, you know, forensic case that is 3,000 years old, then it's not forensic because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to that time frame, okay? Um, as I said, it's 70 to 100 years in the UK, less than 30 years, that cutoff point uh, between archaeology and forensic in other European countries, and it varies in others, okay? But apart from forensic cases, we do humanitarian cases. So in, in the case of Spain, where, where I'm working and living at the moment, uh, partly living at the moment, um, a forensic case goes back to 25 years, and an archaeological case goes back to 100 years over. But when you deal with Spanish Civil War, which is sort of 80 years ago, it's sort of a humanitarian uh, mission, and that is still using forensic protocols. Today, I'm not going to talk more about the, much about the methods that we use, but you can ask me that later on. Um, but what information can we obtain from the bones, okay? And what is our role as forensic anthropologists? A little bit how we identify the deceased. Most of our work is searching for missing people, um, 
for example, um, there's this, the search for Ben Needham, a, a little boy who disappeared in Greece in 1992, um, or we're searching for um, a First World War soldier or a Second World War soldier, and so on. So what techniques do we use for identification? And I think the first thing to say is placing uh, this into context. So human remains are fascinating, apart from, you know, we obviously, to learn about ourselves, um, you know, we can, I can look at human remains from any period, any geographical area, okay? And we have different contexts. So on the top left, these are internet images, some of them are I've worked on, but we've got an individual grave, okay, from prehistory. In the middle, we have a mass grave. Now, we've got mass graves from Roman times. There was one in Gloucester um, from the second century AD from a plague, plague pit with 90 bodies. We have Black Death pits in London from the 15th century. We have Viking mass graves. This is from the Spanish Civil War. Okay. Uh, as you know, there were Spanish, but also a lot of international um, brigades were also participating there. Burnt bone, we've got cremated bone. Now, when you burn a body, even today in a crematorium, you'll always get bone fragments. But what happens is that they're ground at the end of the cremation process to pass them on to families. So this top right image here, which is a Roman cremation burial, um, there's an urn there. Um, you'll always get bone fragments even today, okay, in high crematoria. You've got skeletons in museums, okay, and they have their ethical dilemmas also. Um, and you've got those human remains that are decorating chapels and catacombs, like the Roman catacombs, okay? And this case here, this is me, um, this is from a, a, a press image um, at a crime scene um, where they found a body and the crime scene investigators wanted an anthropologist to help recover the remains, document them and comment on whether we had one individual, um, whether we had any, miss any bones were missing and so on. Okay, so different contexts. Now, apart from that, we have to remain, remain, remind ourselves that human remains also include mummified remains. We've got mummies dealing, you know, not just obviously in Egypt um, or in the Andes, but we have the Alps, so the ice mummy, okay, found in the Italian-Austria border. We have Lindemann in Cheshire from the first century AD and a few others. And the type of information that you can obtain is also enhanced. You can look at stomach contents to see what the last meal was. So some, some people were, were, had a last meal that was special. You've got tattoos, which are sometimes for medical purposes, for, for healing purposes, but also for uh, you know, um, identification in terms of you know, eth ethnicity or, or, or tribal groups. Um, you have... Um, Parasites, potentially, you have soft tissue injuries, but mummified remains are something that we can also examine. Now, when I do a forensic case and I do have mummified remains, I will examine the, the bone through x-rays or through autopsy, okay? So the soft tissue will be examined by the forensic pathologist. And human remains also uh, are part, and not just complete skeletons, but we're also, we also have bone bone fragments or objects that have bones. So this, this one is a, a, this is your shoulder. This is a humerus, this bit here, your shoulder. And it's a scepter from Hawaii. You've got a Tibetan musical instrument that is made of your femur, your thigh bone. Here's the knee end, okay? And you've got this Hawaiian bowl with, with human teeth. So when we look at, when we deal with human remains and legislation, then we're looking at complete skeletons to even objects, okay? The first thing is, why do we excavate and study human remains? Because there are a lot of ethical issues about, you know, why should we disturb the dead and so on. Now, this case here is one I excavated many years ago in France, south of France. Um, and in this case, this is a female, skeleton of a female, a biologically, biological female, um, surrounded by five dog burials or four dog burials. Um, around, but we were excavating this because they were creating, they were they were making a motorway. So obviously, if you don't save these remains, then they'll be destroyed by you know concrete and so on. So it's a matter of recovering them, analyzing them, and if relevant, then we rebury them. Okay, but we excavate and study human remains because, as uh, someone from the US said, study of human remains from archaeological sites and. Just a pause here, I'm mentioning archaeology first because that leads into our forensic cases later on, okay? We can study the, uh, um, the disease, so the origin and evolution of disease 
For example, um, the os osteoarthritis in your knee is more recent than osteoarthritis in your hip, for example. So we can look at what environments may have triggered certain conditions, tuberculosis, syphilis, and so on. We can examine physiological stress, um, especially during childhood. So through malnutrition and infection, we'll get certain markers on the skeleton and your teeth also. Injury, such as trauma or fractures. Physical activities, potentially, we can examine the muscles that you're using or, or, or that people said certain people use. So with certain sports, you, you develop certain muscles which they, they need to anchor on, on bones. So a tennis player, for example, the playing arm will be much thicker than the non-playing arm, but the bones is going to be about 20%, 20 25% thicker, okay? The bone of a playing arm of a, a professional tennis player compared to the, the, the non the non-playing arm, okay? So bones are dynamic tissue. But we can't tell whether someone was a tennis player or a rugby player or a ballet dancer, we can't do that, okay? We can just look at what muscles were used more uh, sort of increasingly. We can look at diet, okay? Through teeth, through chemical analysis, if some of you are chemists, through carbon, nitrogen, strontium, oxygen, okay? And demography, okay? But apart from this, we're also, we're also learning about culture and, and funeral practices. How is the cemetery organized? Um, what's the concept of childhood? And in this case, this is from Italy, from the catacombs of Palermo that we um, have examined a few times with, with some students. Um, it's to do with, you know, people want to be remembered. Um, so we can look at all these attitudes towards death and burial. Um, in this case, we, we, we analyzed these skeletons for preservation, okay? They were, um, they were um, sort of, yes, pr problems with, with preservation and conservation. So we're just trying to obviously, trying to inventory them and, and see um, if, if they were going to be further damage to them. But one of the things before we go into the forensic aspect is the ethical issues. And um, if you've gone to many museums recently, there may be a, a warning sign saying, be aware of human remains. Um, a number of books uh, that we've created. One of the questions is, is it ethical to excavate and study human remains and keep them in museums? So in the Smithsonian Institution, I think they had about 40,000 individuals. Um, my figures are a little bit um, out of date, but some of them are being repatriated now. Um, same with some of the museums in the UK. So we've got skulls from you know, Australian, Aborigines, Tasmanians, um, Hawaiians, they're being repatriated, okay? But also is the issue about, is it ethical to display human remains in museums and television? This, the Irish giant, I don't know if you've been to the Royal College of Surgeons in London, um, but there's this person, Charles Byron was his name from the 19th century, and he was a giant, a very tall person, and he paid... Um, he paid the, the captain of a boat to be buried at sea, and that was his wishes, okay? But obviously when he died, um, you know, one of the surgeons paid the captain of the boat a bit more money, and he's now in a museum. So we know his wishes and we know his name. Does this person need to be, you know, on display? This is one example I helped with in terms of repatriation. Darwin described this, this lady um, and a few others in the 19th century, Julia Pastrana, I don't know if you've seen the film The Greatest Showman, but there was a bearded lady in the film, not quite Julia Pastrana, although in life she actually met P.T. Barnum, Barnum. And this is a Mexican lady, and I was approached many years ago to, to see if I could support these artists, this artist in the middle, um, Laura Anderson Barbata, to um, ask the, Nor the University in Norway who had um, this body since the 1970s. Okay, Julia Pastrana obviously uh, died in, in the 19th century, but she was part of the freak shows in the 19th century and ended up a number of universities and basements. And I just helped to repatriate um, the remains. But of course, we need to understand whether, you know, this body is essential, that we need to analyze it. So if it's, pre if it's a prehistory skeleton, then it's important, but we know about 19th century Mexico. We know about this condition. She had a lot of hair. Um, she had an over-projecting jaw, so um, Darwin described that as the, as the link between ape and human, which obviously isn't correct, um, but she was repatriated. And if you look a bit closer to uh, in Oxford at the Pitt Rivers Museum, where I'm sure many of you have seen these shrunken heads, they're now not on display anymore, okay? Um, they're from Ecuador, I believe, um, and there's all these dilemmas about, you know, who claims the bodies, 
um, what are they going to do after the bodies are repatriated. But, you know, we're returning some of these remains back um, to, you know, where they came from. Forensic anthropology has its also ethical issues. We're dealing with families, we're dealing with names and people. And we're just going to, I just had a little summary for you beforehand about the archaeological aspect and a little bit about the ethics, but let's go into forensic anthropology a little bit more. And these images show um, different types of variety of uh, cases that we do. So we do a, this is a police case, um, body was found here, this is a press image. Um, and here's a search team, okay, they've been informed on what bones are missing and have to be found, and they're going to continue with the search. There's an internet image, it's not my, my field, but we're looking at trauma analysis, say from a homicide case, a gunshot wound, okay, in a lab. More frequently, and, and uh, obviously sadly and tragically, um, but we, we're of uh, much value in disasters, so think about explosions and the London bombings, there were two anthropologists. In 9-11, there were a team of anthropologists working there. And I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more. Um, and most of the disasters that you can think of today or recently will involve forensic anthropologists. Okay, and, and I'll go through the questions that we tend to answer. And lastly, this is a human rights case. This is uh, 19, uh, 104 people that were executed in 1936, Spanish Civil War. You've got a team of pathologists, anthropologists, arche archaeologists, and still living living relatives. And it, this is interesting because I deal with a lot of First and Second World War casualties and we're not allowed to show images of the deceased and it's all screened. But in cases like Guatemala or Argentina or even the Spanish Civil War, you have relatives, they are taking pictures with their phones and you know, it's, um, there's still, still a few living relatives around. So really what do we do as such? Um, so I defined physical, uh, forensic anthropology as physical as, the, as looking at the body. Now there are social cultural anthropologists also working in forensic cases, and, and I won't go into that too much. But we help in locate and recover. Okay. So before we used to be in a laboratory in a morgue, and we used to get a bag of bones um, or a box of bones. But now we go to the scene to help recover the remains, and usually when they're skeletonized. Okay. We help with identification. And sometimes if there's a crime, not everything's a crime scene, there may have been a natural death or a suicide, we help with examining trauma. We do not certify the cause and manner of death. It depends on the country, okay? But that's the work of the forensic pathologist. So the forensic pathologist, we look at the, the drugs, the toxicology, we look at the soft tissue, um, we'll examine the clothing, we'll get the anthropology reports and then certify with the coroner the cause of death. And we also work with the living at times, okay? So I define the living through CCTV images, examining the ear shape, for example, from a suspect with the one from an image or the vein patterns and freckles, anything you can, you, can, you can do. As I said, it's usually when a person isn't recognizable and rather than putting gory pictures, here's a, a 19th century uh, drawing from Japan. And apparently in Japan in the 19th century, there were a lot of depictions of, of, dead, uh, of the dead, of dead woman actually, how they composed. And it has a link with Buddhism apparently, um, which I've been researching recently. Um, and this shows the, the how we decompose. So um, we, we die, then we blow, so there's a lot of gases. Um, the, uh, the gases are released, okay. And then we have um, more skeletonization, scavenging. That's why I don't like the foxes when I see them in Oxford because I know they're scavengers, but yeah. Um, and, and, and what we mainly deal with in forensic anthropology is a semi-decomposed, semi-skeletonized cases, okay? Now, I was in New York in, in 2014 at the medical examiner's office, and we also do fresh bodies. We always access the bone, because sometimes there are people that are found in the streets and documented, and you can't really tell what, what age that person is um, unless we look at the bone, for example, okay? Um, but mainly we deal with skeletonized ones. And all of this aspect of decomposition is called taphonomy. So it's the loss of burial. It's how the temperature, the climate, um, humidity, uh, scavengers, whether the person's buried or not, and clothed, that's going to affect how a body decomposes. So even estimating the time of since death is difficult for us. Okay. Um, but it's a lot of research into this. And it uses chemistry, biochemistry, um, you know, entomology, so I don't know what background you have, but, you know, there is obviously room for almost every discipline to work in, in forensic cases. 
the cases that we work are um, search for missing people, suspicious deaths usually, so homicides, suicide, accident, international deaths, mass fatality incidents, which could be natural, like the tsunami, accidental, like a fire, um, if you think of some of the fire um, incidents that have happened in the, in the UK, or even the wildfires that have happened in Australia or, or California uh, and other parts of the US. Terrorist incidents will be there, because remember that what we're dealing with are fragments of bone, okay, or bones, okay? So um, when, a, when, the, when there's fire, you get Bod a body's been calcined usually when there's an explosion you get fragmentation so you need anthropologists to identify that bone okay human rights cases and the living nowadays our role is quite important so um there's a number of anthropologists and pathologists working with the migrants okay this one on the top left is migrants that are losing their lives in the mediterranean so there's a team uh, working in sicily to identify them, as well as with the International, International Committee for the Red Cross. There's a lot of work, uh, unfortunately, in the US-Mexico border. So most of the, um, the people that are involved in identifying those dead are anthropologists, okay? Because bodies become skeletonized quite quickly with the heat and scavengers and so on. This is um, the Falkland Islands, um, as many of you know, from 1982. Um, I was due to go up there in 2017 uh, with the International Committee for the Cross. I had my, my ticket booked, but there was a big case in, in London, which you may, a bit, may be aware, and I was working there for a few months. But the aim here was a humanitarian aim, was to exhume those soldiers that were unidentified to obtain a DNA sample, okay? And um, then there were some relatives that, you, that they used to, to obviously look at reference material. To documentarian cases and mass disasters, okay, like tsunamis or so on. <laughs> so at what point will we be called? Maybe come to the scene. This is a, a case I did. This is all press images, a case I did in London. Okay, a lot of bodies in back gardens, I'm afraid. So um, it has happened before where, you know, someone's been killed and rather than taking them out of the house, placing them in the car and driving for hours, you know, outside London, they're buried in the back garden and, you know, a patio has been built and they sell the house and that's what happens. So a lot of some bodies in back gardens. To the scene and the mortuary, uh, sometimes just a mortuary or, or a lab. If there's a if there's a bone fragment that we're not sure if it's human or not human, we may do histology or um, I, I don't know what your background is, but extra diffraction or so on. Okay. And we, be, we may be called by the police. I can go through this later on if you want. The crime scene manager or CSI, detectives. Sometimes the pathologists and defence barristers, okay, who will want us to peer review um, a, um, a a statement, okay. Then we're part of a national team. I'm part of the UK Disaster Victim Identification, so we're on standby for the Olympics, for example, or for any major incident um, involving um, British nationals. Within the crime scene, and I won't go too much into detail. Um, there are a number of individuals working. The senior investigating officer, who's a senior, a high-ranking police officer, I think a team of detectives, uh, working statements, exhibits officers. So everything, every evidence um, that we recover, it will be my initials, or in this case, maybe the exhibits officer who deals with the evidence. MC manager who's running around with the phone and and, and coordinating everything. The CSIs or, or so-called scenes of crime officer. Um, the police advisory team, um, home office pathologist, sometimes comes to this, the scene, not always. Um, a family liaison officer who are, are dealing with the families and trying to liaise between the police investigation and the families and obtaining also information about the, the loved ones, about information about age and stature and things like that. Okay. So this is one of the, uh, I, I've done a few international uh, operations with the police. Um, this is one of them um, in the island of Greece, of course, in Greece, this is me here with South Yorkshire police and some other um, police officers. And we're searching for, for a missing person, okay? So one of the questions that I am asked as a forensic anthropologist is, is this bone or is it a stone, okay? Because when you're looking for, um, remains of a child, you know, you're looking at small fragments of bones, small ends of bones that may look like stones. But also we're dealing with fields that may have animal bones. So one of the questions that I'm often asked 
when we find the bone, is it human or not human? And I usually do this visually, okay? Um, so just, and if, if I have any doubt, we do it microscopically. This case here is a team um, in Germany, and it, we're working for the US Department of Defense, Prisoner of War, and Missing in Action Agency, Counting Agency. And we're trying to recover the remains of a crew, a part of the crew from a Second World War bomber, which crashed in Germany and South Germany, and obviously there's an explosion. So what we're expecting to see is with the crash and explosion and fire, a small bone fragment. So here's a team screening the soil that we've recovered from the crater area um, of the crash, finding human remains. Also, um, this is an internet image. Um, look at surface remains. So we, um, we speak with the police and we say, okay, what questions do you want answered? Because sometimes, it's not about identification, it's mainly about trauma analysis. So there's a number of questions that we're asked to, to address, but we can't address all of them. So we can't address necessarily the cause and manner of death as a pathologist, but we can look at the damage on the bones to find out if the damage is recent um, from, I don't know, transportation or, or scavenging, or if it's around the time of death. The time of since death is also difficult, but there are plants, okay, and plants go grow over a body. If you send those plants to a botanist, that, that person may be able to say whether the, the remains have been growing for more than seven months, for example. Okay, so a number of questions we do with surface remains. We also help forensic archaeologists. Now I'm a dual archaeologist, anthropologist, um, but remember that when we're, when we're, exa when we're um, excavating clandestine graves, this is another um, case of a body in a back garden, and this is another one here in London, um, you know, maybe fresh bodies. But what we're looking at is when the grave is being opened, okay, and the body's placed, there's not enough soil, so there's too much soil, there's a bit of spoil or surplus around, the body decomposes, there's a sinking of the grave, and you can look at these anomalies in the ground, okay? And then what you do is you excavate those anomalies. And the number of, sometimes, bodies in concrete, like this one, um, so these are cases that have worked on, but these are press, press images. We work on exhumations, not quite criminal. So those that died in the 1980s and before sort of DNA work was undertaken to identify the missing, um, so pre-1984, 1986, um, they may be now identifiable, they, they may have narrowed it down to a number of people, we've got families, so we want to exhume the body to get a DNA a sample for DNA analysis. Sometimes, like in this one in Chile, there are some exhumations of historical figures like President Allende or a poet, Pablo Neruda. And it's to, it's to examine things like whether it was a suicide or a homicide. So there's a number of exhumations being taken place, okay, um, at the moment. We've got this mass fatality incident. And one of the things, if you think about 9-11, um, you know, there are obviously human individuals, there are pets, and also there are... Um, bones from restaurants, animal bones. So at the beginning, the important thing is to separate what is human from non-human bone. That's going to save a lot of time, resources, money, okay? And we've got to identify the bone. I mean, even to, you know, the, the size of a fingertip, okay, your fingernail, smaller than that, you know? Um, and as you know, DNA is destructive, so we want to try to inventory what that bone is and, and so on, okay? So we're really involved in DNA uh, in disasters. And some of the cases where anthropologists have, have worked and 9-11, we said, London bombings. Um, this is the, the California wildfires, okay? Um, uh, which, again, you're looking at all of the debris is going to be the same color as bones, so trying to identify, separate debris from, from, from human bone. Okay, and this one, Grenfell Tower, that as we know, um, there are a number of anthropologists working there. Okay, and human rights. We've seen this image, but you also have smaller um, graves. There's six individuals of six reconstruction there, but the anthropologist is trying to attribute um, certain bones to certain individuals to minimize that DNA sampling. And more importantly, they're buried with objects, okay, um, with photographs and personal effects. And we try to, we need to try to establish which object goes with which skeleton, okay, to help with identification. 
we examine trauma analysis. So even though this is not going to court, we still document how, in this case, you know, they were executed from the back of the head, okay? Um, including actually one of my great uh, grandfather. Um, although I'm doing Spanish for war cases before I knew my, my, family's, my family's history. Um, so so um, yes, yeah, so we document this trauma analysis. Okay? And then um, we deal with, sorry, war casualties. I should maybe, I don't know if you can see yourself, I should maybe, um, war casualties, okay? And it is forensic, it's not forensic in the sense, it's not a police case, but it is forensic in that we're following forensic protocols. We're working with DNA labs that um, follow forensic protocols. Uh, we've also been told that any misidentification can go to court, okay? Um, and what, what tends to happen is that the human remains from the war, they, they're found in trenches sometimes, um, and they're recovered by non-specialists, and it's all a mix. So we're sent, uh, we, we had a contract four years with the Ministry of Defence, it's a joint casualty compassionate centre. And we were sent to France, Belgium, to obtain DNA samples. But when we arrived there, we realised that all the remains were, were mixed together. So we're trying to separate the bones from one individual. So we had people lying about their age. There was one, one individual who was 14, between 14 and 16 years of age, who lied about being older. And these bones don't fuse, obviously, until 18. So, we, so we're looking at unfused bones. We could attribute bones to an individual. And I've been in the last few years working to help recover casualties, not just British, but also in German and French, Australian, uh, New Zealand, US soldiers recently from the Second World War. Um, and it's, it's just an amazing work. And the, the objects that you find really pro provide that humanity and sometimes very emotional, sort of, uh, it's very emotional work at times. So how can we help? And I've said um, what cases we deal with, I've said sort of um, what information we can obtain, but we can help by searching, as we've said, identifying whether something is bone, whether it's human bone, um, you know, so, you know, the question says, we've got a skull, what can you tell us about it? Is it male, female? Is it an adult? Is it a non-adult? Non -adult? Can you help us identify the deceased? Um, can you reconstruct the remains? So it's sort of gluing the pieces together. Okay, we may have a very fragmented um, skull from an explosion, and we're trying to um, piece, glue everything together um, for the relatives to also look for trauma. And we're not necessarily answering all these questions in one case, okay? It depends on what we ask. Any injury, has it been burnt, dismembered, cut? Um, you reconstruct the face, help identification, any other advice I can give. Okay? So there are more questions, but just to simplify that. Okay? Obtaining anti-mortem information. So the number of missing, we need social anthropologists actually, or, or, or psychologists to speak to families to obtain the information on the deceased you know, what their physical characteristics were, what they looked like, and so on. Okay. One of the questions is, is it human or non-human bone? And it's fairly straightforward because of differences in terms of, you know, anatomy that we have. Um, and the, the, it's fairly straightforward. We just need to look at the ends of the bones and visually I'm able to say whether they're human or not, something through photographs, okay? we we'll also ask how, um, how old the remains are. Now, in this case, we have a pot, which is thousands of years old. Sometimes we have clothing or dental fillings that's gonna give us a date, or we just recommend radiocarbon dating, okay? Um, which may help to say if, if a body's post 1950s or 1950s um, or, or older. What bones are there? This is an ossuary that I had to excavate because the walls of the cemetery were collapsing and the builders had to access to reinforce the walls. So we had to excavate um, and find out what bones they were, and then we study them, uh, and what bones are missing in, in a case. How many individuals? Okay, this is um, an archaeological case. But sometimes we can account for some people that are unaccounted for. So, um, you know, for a case from the Second World War, they may say, uh, in this bomber, B-17, B-24, we had a crew of six. But it turns out that maybe a seventh person just jumped last minute. That has happened. 
um, into the plane just to, to, to be transported. And we, we may be able to identify um, an extra person, okay, by a, a repeated number of bonds. And we mainly do, and I'm not going into the methods, you can ask me, is the bulk of our work is the biological profile. It's the age at death. We can examine the teeth that are developing in children, the bones that are fusing. So the skeleton will develop and fuse up to about the age of 25 to 30 years, okay? Um, unfortunately, after 30 years, including myself, we, 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 we examine the generative changes, okay, in the skeleton. The biological sex, mainly through the hips, okay, as you know, in, in, in women, um, slightly different uh, to cater for, for pregnancy and childbirth, but also the skull is different. Depends on, on a number of things like hormones and, and, and so on, and the dimensions of the bone sometimes. And then ancestry, which is a, quite a controversial topic. If someone, say, um, Hispanic or, or Afro-American or European white descent, stature, body build, and then unique features that we have. So all our sinuses that we have in our, in our frontal or other parts, they're all unique, like our fingertips. So we had an X-ray or a CT scan of someone during life. We can compare that with um, a CT or an X-ray of the skull, okay? Or anything medical, any medical devices may have a serial number that are, are unique. Some serial numbers can be a batch, but some are unique. What this gives us in this example from Canada is we're narrowing down the list of missing people. So if we say we have in Canada over 1,500 reported missing, and we are saying the skeleton is that of a female, then we reduce that. If we say that between in those females, the age range between 20 and 40 years is further reduced, and ancestry and stature, we're just reducing, narrowing down the list of missing people so we can then approach families for a DNA sample. I don't do this, it requires uh, obviously artistic, now it's computerized a lot, but with Ukrainian facial reconstruction. Um, Richard III was undertaken by sort of hand, that's just because it's a museum display. Most of the reconstructions today are computerized, okay? It's placing a face, okay, putting a face to a skull. Um, this is from the First World War, German casualty from France. Perhaps this may, these images may help us identify some of these casualties or migrants to the at sea or, or anyone else. Um, so facial reconstruction is helping um, to bring families to come forward. So you may have an image in the media, TV, and you may be able to recognize the face of that person. This Missing Persons Bureau, I'm finishing in, in a few minutes. Um, you know, we, we, we placed all this information as placed into Missing Persons Bureau with a facial reconstruction to try to identify remains. Really, in order to identify a body, you need DNA or fingerprints, but in skeletal remains, you won't have that, or dental evidence, okay? Or anything unique like a medical device. Anthropology is really secondary, okay? It's, you know, if you, look at, if you, if you think of um, a group of soldiers in a particular grave, they may be male, they may be between 20 and 30 years old, similar stature, so it's difficult to sometimes say, okay? According to the International Committee for the Red Cross, we as anthropologists are really sort of not necessarily providing a positive identification, but we're helping narrow down that list of missing people. Okay. Um, there are some methods that are being developed to help um, anthropologists provide that positive, that sort of, well, it's 100%, but positive identification. In some cases, though, like humanitarian cases, we have the list of people that are buried in a grave. Um, this from the Spanish Civil War, you've got a list of people that are there and their age. So you may be able to separate the 14 year old from the 50 year old um, anthropologically, and that may be sufficient with clothing and photographs and artifacts. And maybe the, the, the younger adults may be um, sampled for DNA analysis. Okay, this is a cemetery of the bottles. One of uh, my team has examined, or well, sorry, a team that I work with have examined, and it's because every skeleton was buried with a bottle. You may ask, why is that? Well, it's a message in a bottle. Um, there was not enough money for a gravestone um, or grave marker, and the undertaker uh, used bottles to place on a piece of paper with the name of the deceased, um, the, the date where they died, and their age. And what, what we're trying to do as anthropologists is just to corroborate that with that, that information on the, on the piece of, on the message with the skeleton. 
Apart from this biological profile, the last thing we do is trauma analysis. So it's this fractures, but mainly are the fractures on the bone during life from say an accident, cycling or, 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 or falling from somewhere, or is it through a stab wound, through a gunshot wound um, or blunt force trauma, you know, from a, from a car accident. And it's, it's, it's a challenging topic, I'm not going to go much into this, but this also leads to the question in fire scenes, are these bones that um, have been burnt, you've got these fracture lines, are these fractures caused by the heat or are they caused by a, by a blow to the head? Okay, so there's a lot of research going on with that. In terms of research, if final slides, is these body farms that you may have heard, okay? This is where people donate their bodies and they try to estimate how bodies decompose. There are five or six in the US, one in Australia, one opening in Canada, and uh, one, in, one in, 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 in Netherlands, and they're debating whether one should be open in the UK, okay? Um, but this is about people donating their bodies and they're doing experiments to see how long it takes to decompose, okay? So that's sort of a very quick, okay, tour of forensic anthropology. And what I'll say is that, uh, you know, I, I, I studied in archaeology, I was going to go into medicine, and then I found this niche, which covers a little bit of everything. And um, it, it's really rewarding aspect, okay, we, we're here to help recover the missing, search and recover them. Um, we've got to continue being strong in what we do, which is the estimation of sex and age at death and ancestry and stature. And we do that through research, the number of biobanks today. Um, where we can obtain that information from hospital CT scans and so on. It's about learning about ourselves, um, about how we evolve, and perhaps justice, depending on, on the conflict. But the most important thing is dignity to the deceased, but also to the relatives, okay, to bring them closure. And with that, I will end to say peace, love, and forensic anthropology. Thank you. What a wonderful introduction to a very little known topic. Nick, thank you very much indeed. That was really absolutely, truly fascinating. I don't know anything, I didn't know anything about it until this moment and I feel I know quite a bit more now, although I don't think it's a future career for me somehow. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions they would like to put to Nick? Would you like to wave your hand? Yes, Mary. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I wonder if you've been to North Hertfordshire Museum uh, and seen um, the first recorded triplets. Um, a woman who gave birth, you, oh, it's a very, very interesting. They have okay. the skeleton of a woman who, and her three triplets because she died in childbirth. Mm -hmm. and she, was, she lived in Baldock, Hertfordshire, oh, I think in the early centuries BC. It, it is fascinating. Okay, okay, so uh, I don't know that, but I'll, uh, I'll make a note. So it's, I guess, from what I'm listening is that it's quite fascinating to see human remains. I think sometimes human remains are taken away from this place, from museums. It happened in Manchester with Egyptian mummies. They were, they stopped and the public, the public wanted to see human remains, they're educational. So um, I guess in your case, you, you thought it was, you, you were quite happy to see human remains in the museum. Is that correct? Well, if it's just a skeleton, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's not like the body, was it body works or body worlds where everybody's, you, you see all these other gross anatomy. Okay, okay, heads. okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, thanks for that. I'll make a note. Thank you. Okay. Alex, have you a question for us? Thank you, Nicholas. That was really uh, so enlightening and, and so well presented. Thank you so much. Um, it, we, there are quite a number of TV shows these days that feature the, the sort of work that you're involved in. I'm thinking of th things like um, Silent Witness and the like. Mm -hmm. To what extent are they accurate representations of the sort of work that you're engaged in, or are, are they sort of highly fictionalised? Okay. So one of the things is, obviously, when I studied this, um, there were no series or episodes like this. And now we get a lot of students, you know, coming to the forensic science or anthropology because they've seen these. So in a, in a way, it helps to, pr to promote the discipline, especially bones. Now, in terms of how reality is like, I mean, we, I don't deal with families, really, and I don't arrest people, and I don't tend to go, you know, silent witness, they sort of, 
um, you know, they do all sorts of things. You know, I'm, I'm sort of in the mortuary on the, on, on the lab. I sometimes do with families in human, human rights cases because they come and visit the, the grave. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think everything is so fastly done. Um, I think everything, everybody can identify who the person is and who caused the trauma. So it's not that easy, I guess, or challenging. And of course, you don't have the nasty smell, for example, of things or, um, you know, the gory, gory aspects. Um, I mean, I, 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 I used to watch them and um, silent witness less because it, they were dealing with more sensitive um, topics, you know, like terrorist attacks, something that are very close to the bone, as someone said, um, in terms of some of the cases that were present. I know the, the advisors for silent witness, um, the pathologists, um, but yeah, I, I would see ourselves um, more in the searching, more treat, less in the media, less arrest. We can't arrest people. We don't interview people and it's just a human rights family. So, so yeah, but it has helped the discipline. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else with a burning question? I'd like to ask you something. You okay. mentioned that you've worked in a lot of different countries. Now, you, you are obviously bilingual, so part Spanish and part British, is that right? Scottish, I hear, actually. Yes. Um, but you mentioned working on uh, what Second World War, I think, it seems, in Belgium. You worked in Flanders, haven't you, and Germany yep. also. So mm -hmm. why would they get you, who are, is normally based either in Spain or Britain, why would you be invited to go there? Do they not have enough forensic people of their own, um, or what? Okay. So I guess the first thing is that in the UK, at my level, there, there are eight certified or chartered forensic anthropologists. Um, one of them does the facial reconstruction. So really, it's about seven of us that uh, do a lot of, sort of police work. Um, I used to work for forensic science providers. They're big DNA companies. And the big DNA companies used to have contracts with the Ministry of Defence. So we started going to France for a Ministry of Defence sort of contracts to look up First World War. In fact, one of the first cases, I don't know if there's some people from Australia here, um, but there's, there's a First World War grave, mass grave from 1916 in France at Fromeau where almost 250 Australian soldiers died there, okay? So this is the first sort of um, time where, yeah, sort of the Ministry of Defence and Australian and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission started getting anthropologists to, to work with. Um, in terms of myself, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I have... Um, I guess, I mean, I've, I've written a few reference books. So I've got a number of edited books. One is uh, Forensic Archaeology, A Global Perspective, where uh, and one's on legislation worldwide. And in those those books, we've got, I've got 60 countries contributing to those volumes, uh, looking at legislation and how the practices for, for forensic anthropology. I've, I've just published one on ethics. Um, and again, it has 130 co-authors there, so uh, in terms of contributors. So, and the thing is, I'm always willing to help. So I think that's, that's the thing. So, um, you know, but I do it through the heart. I don't go to conference and I try to meet people. I just literally like pe meeting people in my field. I was called by the Vatican a few years ago um, for a Spanish Civil War case because they were trying to beatify some of the priests that were killed. Um, and I just said, of course, you know, the same with the German casualties. If they need help, you know, I I'm quite objective and I just, just want to help so maybe I don't know I don't know why but yeah they just contact me and I just usually say yes but I have to calm down and, and start saying no potentially. <laughs> but you've um, also worked outside Europe haven't you Nick? Am I right to think you worked in places like Hawaii? And, uh... Yeah so Hawaii is the base for the US Department of Defense it's, it's their missing in action lab and they work in Vietnam, um, Southeast Asia um, and also, uh, I was in, a, in the Pacific in Kiribati, Republic of Kiribati, a big US Japanese um, World War II um, in battle. But last year at Wilson, as you know, I organized a symposium on First and Second World War, and I brought people from Lithuania, from you know um, Poland, you know Canada, and so on. International Committee for the Red Cross, um, and I was one of the anthropologists at Grenfell Tower. I was I was a lead anthropologist in the mortuary for several months 
Um, so, so I guess, yeah, I've got a lot of connections and network and, um, yeah. So maybe I should calm down. And this year, being at home in Spain has been nice, actually, <laughs> not having to travel so much. What was the most interesting place abroad that you've worked so far? Mm. It's difficult. Every case I do, I remember. So I've done over 100 cases and I remember them very, very closely. Um, and they all have their different issues. I mean, back to even the UK, where um, I remember the first case I did, I should have been mentored. And my boss says, I don't have time to go with you, just just go. And I did the first four or five cases on my own. And the first case was near the N25. And the police said, you're the specialist, open the sleeping bag. Um, it was in a forest and I was just so scared that maybe a rat would come out, you know, not about the bones. Um, but after that, I had a little baby in an attic and I think this baby died in the 1940s and he had um, a cloth on his mouth, you know, like shoved on his mouth. And that was quite shocking. Um, but I think what I really like in maybe the first Second World War casualties uh, in Germany or elsewhere, where one piece of bone, just one tiny piece of bone is all you need something to identify. So finding that um, it, it's just, I mean, I, I, I was in, um, I was part of uh, um, a Metropolitan Police deployment in Portugal, south of Portugal, you probably know the case. Um, I was obviously in Greece twice with the um, police and I, and I learned from all of them. So. I wouldn't say there's anything that stands out apart from finding, perhaps in Spain, Spanish reward is that gunshot wound um, in the skull that's going to, you know, or, or that piece of fragment in a, in a, in a pilot um, that's going to help identify that person. So, yeah, all sorts. But also I work on uh, museums uh, where I we, we help with repatriation. So I've, I've, I've examined a lot of Australian um, Hawaiian Native American skull, uh, yeah, um, skulls, and and they're so fascinating. You know, I do that to help out because I learn so much about cultures and so on. So yeah, no concrete answer. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? Otherwise, I'm going to ask yet another one. Susan, your hand went up first, I think. But the microphones. Uh... Sorry about that. Um, I'm an archaeologist and uh, I've come across a few skeletons in my time uh, and worked with them. But I've been very interested to see in recent years the work of um, uh, uh, people uh, studying isotopic um, analysis. I think it's strontium, isn't it, if I remember rightly? Yes, yeah. On, on teeth, uh, which actually gives you an indication of where people spent their first years, where they grew up. And I, I wondered if that's an area that you've worked in at all. It's very interesting because it reveals patterns of migration, for example, in antiquity, which um, of which we were ignorant before or, or which were very disputed uh, and, and uh, now can be resolved. Thank you, Susan. Um, what, what's your area of expertise? What, what, what period? Well, I'm a Roman, Roman specialist. Okay, okay, great. So, um, yeah, this, um, so the number of isotopes that have been used, so there's carbon and nitrogen, which is helpful to find out the diet, okay, whether it's marine or terrestrial protein, uh, C4 plants, maize or C3 plants. And then there's strontium and oxygen and maybe sulfur. Strontium is used for provenance as Susan's mentioned. I mean, a few studies on the Roman diaspora, I think it's called Project at the University of Reading or on, on, on where certain individuals came yes, from. Right. Um, I, I used this in pre, I, I'm from Ibiza originally in Spain um, and, I, and I examined Carthaginian pre-Roman Punic populations. And one of the questions is, you know, how was Ibiza, I, I'm now in Mallorca, it was colonized, you know, was it people that came from North Africa, from Carthage or from mainland Spain. So we use some of these isotopes to find out um, if people grew outside the island and where from. So what you do is, like you said, you, ex you examine the teeth, okay? So in some cases, what you eat, what your environment, okay, it provides um, 
and it's 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 trying to think out. So yeah, it's basically the teeth will tell you where you've grown, and the bone will tell you the last few years of your life. So in terms of forensic cases, it has happened with an Australian First World War soldier, because they were trying to find out, um, you know, whether he he grew up in Britain and things like that. And I think that helped narrow down the list of missing people. There was a torso found in the Thames, and it turns out they ha it has some black magic, I think, rituals. Um, but with isotope analysis, they were able to sort of pinpoint a little bit some of the countries that that person could could belong to. But in Britain, there's a lot of bodies that are found at sea. And sometimes they may have been washed from, you know, um, continental Europe. And um, one of the isotope analysis that has been doing, obviously, I can tell you if it's, say, I don't know, depends, North England, South England, with part of Wales, Scotland, and a few others. So it's going to give you some, some countries and possibilities. Um, and they're trying to do this with the US-Mexico border because obviously not all of the people that go into the US are Mexicans, some are from Guatemala or farther down south. They're trying to figure out through isotope analysis um, what they're doing. I'm not an expert. I have worked in publications with people in Oxford. Rick Schulting was at Wilson College um, and a few others. Um, and, and, and I take the samples for isotopes. Um, but yeah, we're it is getting developed, yeah. Um, thank you Doug you've got a question I yeah. think yes uh, recently the American Association of Physical Anthropologists changed its name to American Association of Biological Anthropologists uh, uh, due to sensitivities about the, the first name implying co colonialist or, or having colonialist or rac racialist overtones. Uh, has it, have the sensitivities in that, uh, evidenced by that, affected the course of your, of your career? Um, so there's, there's been a big, a big debate about um, Ancestry, so estimation, you know, and and there was a book published by University of Florida Press, I think a few months ago, that the British Association of Biological Anthropology has tried to tell them they should stop publishing um, because it's still with a lot of colonial emphasis there. My problem at the moment in police cases in the UK, and sorry to not mention much of the US, is what terminology should we be using and whether it is possible to, to, to tell the physical, I guess, appearance, I don't know what the words are, you know, white European, East Asian, uh, from an individual. But it's a very hot topic. And um, the I've been into three or four conversations, workshops already this year about this. Um, but yeah, they've changed the name, rightly so. Are you, are you a physical anthropologist or a biological anthropologist? No, I'm a computer scientist. But you're very aware of that. Okay, okay, you're very aware of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think all of this colonialism is sort of, that's why there's a lot of repatriation of human remains now back to, I know Germany repatriated some skulls to Namibia um, and Britain is doing the same for Tasmanians and so on. But th there's all this thing about the concept of Afro, you know, Afro-American, white European background, Hispanic, it's very difficult at the moment. And there is a computer program in the US called, uh, well, for, for this, it's a computer program where you apparently enter the measurements of the skull and it tells you which group it belongs to. Okay, but of course, there's, there's computing state there, okay? But what happens is that someone has, uh, there's a group called Hispanic, but if you think about Cuba, in Cuba you're gonna have people that are um, so more sort of Afro-Caribbean, so physical appearance, some that are more indigenous and some that have white European ancestry. And they're still called Hispanic. So in the database, they're called Hispanic. So it, it's, it's, it's uh, I hesitate about this topic and I'm trying to figure out what is the best term to use for British um, police cases. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very hot topic at the moment. And it's a very challenging one too. So it hasn't quite affected me personally as such, but it is affecting the way 
we teach, for example, I don't know how to teach this topic, especially when I have people from different backgrounds and I try not to emphasize on a particular skull morphology or not. Um, and I think it's going to be difficult to when identify um, teeth, for example, if you come from East Asia, 95% of the people there have a certain shape in their incisors that you have 5% of European, white Europeans. Um, so there's some traits, but it's becoming quite difficult now with, you know, travel and so on. I'm not sure if that's answered your question, but... Um, yeah. Quite thoroughly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I've just got one burning question, if, if nobody else has another one. Um, you mentioned several times, uh, you, you mentioned the word methods, and each time you said, well, I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, mm. But could you possibly say something about that, that uh, a complete okay. scientific ignoramus such as myself might understand, just briefly? Okay. So I guess the first thing is when I examine a skeleton, I lay the bones out on a table, okay? And I try to identify them visually, you know, even if it's a small fragment, okay? Um, there's certain traits like you've got face, blood vessel imprints, you have the ends of the bones are different. Then you do, you, you examine the condition of the bones, which could have been affected by, you know, weather and so on. Um, and then you proceed to either sex estimation or age at death, okay? Um, if, you, if you've got children's remains or juvenile remains, depending on the period that you're talking to, you're going to examine teeth, okay, how to develop milk teeth, um, permanent teeth. So there's all these charts that you use to, to aid someone. I still need my books when I go to the mortuary as well as my other colleagues. You know, you can't memorize all the formula. You can also look at fusion of the bones. So um, this arm bone, so one humerus in an adult is about three to five segments in a child. Okay, so these bones fuse at 18 to 20. The collarbone, your clavicle, which is at 25, at the end of your spine, sacrum at 30. Okay, and after 30, you sort of degenerate uh, skeletally, okay, you should say. <laughs> you have more experience in life and so on. And you rely on other methods. So um, your ribbons, for example, uh, they become, you've got cartilage. As you get older, uh, you become ossified and cartilage. The cartilage becomes bone almost calcified, okay? Um, the pubis area, so your groin area will have some degenerative changes. Also, it'll be more porous at the age of 60 onwards. Um, it will be complete about the age of 30, 40, um, and it'll be ridges and furrows at the age of 20, okay? So we're looking at the morphology and the texture of some of those bones. Um, teeth are not that reliable um, to look at wear, but as you grow older, you, you know, you, you get more wear in your teeth, but it just depends on, on a number of factors. Um, and you've got disease. So you may have someone with osteoporosis, which, you know, you could be an older person. Um, there are other diseases that are more um, in older individuals. So but what we can only do is provide wide age ranges. So 2025, 20, we 30 to 50 and 50 plus. That's what we can do in skeletal remains. Okay, we can't really narrow it down to more than, you know, to less than five years, for example, or even 10 years. Okay. So then once, once we know it's an adult and we look at the hips for age and the ribs um, and uh, the disease, we may look at um, the hips and skull for male or female. Um, the, the female um, pelvis is wider. And there's a number of traits that you can use. And now it's always never the case that it's clear, black and white. There's always overlap between, between features, okay? In males, sometimes you have more prominent brow ridges and more prominent back of the, of the so that's more male features. Um, and then you know, examine statue. With statue, you can measure a bone, any bone in your body almost, and you can apply an equation to create a statue, which will be, again, within a range, okay? So it's not completely that sort of um, accurate in a, in a way, yeah. But yes, yeah, so there's more technical stuff I can tell you about, but that's that's the main methods, yeah. Sorry, microphone. Thank you. You're talking about okay. examining these things, so you examine them visually, but you also use presumably some kind of machinery, don't you, to analyze that you don't? Sometimes, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to use histology um, to look at more microstructures, or you want to use um, 
CT scans or imaging, but otherwise visually is fine at the moment. Yeah. yeah. My goodness, that's really interesting. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? If not, I think we will just thank Dr. Marcus Grant very warmly for his fascinating introduction to this extraordinary subject. Uh, I think all the work you're doing is obviously absolutely terrific. I don't know how you do it. Um, thank you very much indeed for devoting your time to telling us about it. Uh, of course, thank you very time. much indeed. Thanks everybody for being there. Thank okay. you for coming. It's lovely to thank see you. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.